I'm joined by the U.S. Commerce Secretary now, Will Barras. Thanks for being here. Good to see you, David. Uh, nice to see you, too. We had a chance to talk about a year ago here, but you've certainly been with my colleagues plenty and with us as well uh, via the wonders of television recently. But things are always changing. So <laughs> let's start with some of the recent news. Uh, we've extended the exemption to the 232 tariffs for the EU. Yes. For a month. Yes. Why? Because we're having some potentially fruitful discussions about an overall reduction in trade tensions between the EU and ourselves. And what does productive talks mean? What does that actually well, involve? Well, what it means is that we're getting into a whole lot of topics. There hasn't been serious discussion with the EU since the TTIP talks broke off shortly before the Trump administration came in. So there are a lot of issues, and um, we're hopeful that something good will come out of it. Yeah, is it something that you could imagine continues so that there's yet another extension and another? Would that be typical, or, or as time goes by, should we look for some sort of marker that either you've moved to close to right. uh, agreement or not? Well, I don't think we have any intention of protracted extensions. That defeats the whole purpose. The EU is around 15 percent of all the steel we bring in. So if we're going to impose it, we'll have to do it pretty soon or else people will start gaming the system. Uh, South Korea has got the exemption that they wanted for good, correct? Well, it's not an exemption. South Korea agreed to uh, uh, right. I, I tariffs did. on the aluminum and to a very low quota, 70 percent of their 2015-17 average shipment. So I wouldn't call that an exemption. It fits in very well. Understood. Um, you're leaving for China later today. Yes, this evening. Uh, what are your expect? Who are you meeting with over there? Well, we're meeting with the senior people. It'll be Secretary Mnuchin, myself, Ambassador Lighthizer, uh, Larry Kudlow, and Peter Navarro. And the counterparts that you'll be negotiating with are are who? The same proportionate level people. And the expectations, again, going into these talks, uh, when we report on them or hear things, should we be thinking that you're going to come back with some sort of a deal? Do you go in hoping that you'll actually reach some sort of an agreement, or is it part of just more talking that's going to continue between the two countries? Well, there's been talking between the two countries for years and years and years. President Trump is of the view it's now time for action. So what does that mean? Well, our trade deficit is too big and too continuing, too chronic, and too inspired by evil practices. Are you optimistic then? I mean, typically in, in for conversations like the ones that you're going to begin uh, tomorrow, the groundwork has been laid. Has it been laid for you to potentially reach agreement do you know whether the Chinese have come to a certain place where there's not that much distance between the two parties? You never know where you are until you actually get into the conference room. And it's not my practice to negotiate things in the press room, as, as you know. It should be in the conference room. Are you, are you optimistic? I wouldn't be going all the way over there if I didn't think there was some hope. Some hope. That doesn't sound optimistic. You can't prejudge. This, these talks have been going on for a very long time. The issues are very squarely in front of everyone. The changed ingredient is we do have the two 232s pending, and we also have the 301 pending regarding intellectual property rights. So that's a different frame of reference from what we've had before. I understand that. You know, it's funny, the 232, the tariff side, and then the intellectual property side get linked, but they're very distinct. I mean, is it possible you could feel as though you have victory on one and not another, but you're okay with that? Because stealing intellectual property or forcing companies to share it is a very different thing than dumping steel or aluminum. Well, not really. It's really all about behavior. Steel and aluminum deal with today's world what is right now. Intellectual property rights deal with the future. We have to safeguard both what's going on today and the future. And in fact, on IPR, next month, the Patent Office, which is part of Commerce, will issue its 10 millionth patent. 10 million patents. No country has ever remotely approached that total. That's our future, is intellectual property rights.
Yeah, it's interesting in talking about that, of course, uh, our future is also things like 5G and wireless, sure. which has come up a lot in our conversations yesterday. We had the CEOs of T-Mobile and Sprint who right. announced their deal, very focused on that and saying that China is ahead of us. Is that true? You never know who's really ahead or behind until it's truly perfected. Nobody has 5G totally perfected yet. I think the pitch that uh, Sprint and T-Mobile are making is an interesting one, that their merger would propel uh, Verizon and ATT into more active pursuit of 5G. Whoever pursues it, whoever does it, we're very much in support of 5G. We need it. We need it for defense purposes. We need it for commercial purposes. We really need to be the player in 5G. So that is a, uh, uh, one of the priorities for this administration. Oh, for sure. You can't neglect the important parts of technology. Um, we've talked to you many times, of course, uh, over the last few months, Wilbur. But what comes up a lot in the conversation with you and with other experts related to China trade is TPP. And I can't tell you how many people we have on, from both the left and the right, who say we never should have withdrawn from TPP. Well, I couldn't disagree more uh, with them. TPP was a flawed deal. And if you go roll the camera back to November of 2016, whoever was elected president, there would have been no TPP. Hillary Clinton came out against it several times. President Trump clearly was against it. There was no will, no political will in either party in, in the Congress for TPP. Well, uh, uh, you know, you've obviously said flawed. The president, uh, in his interview with Joe Kernan some time back, also talks about that f as well. What's the flaw? What is the key problem? Because the president at least has entertained the idea of potentially considering going into it if the conditions were right. But sure. what are the flaws and what are the conditions okay. we would need to conceivably well, reenter? The president has always said that it's the terms of the deal that matter. And one of the many flaws in the TPP was the rules of origin. As you know, that's a big topic in the NAFTA talks right now. But it's even a weaker provision in TPP than we had in the old NAFTA, the NAFTA 1.0. So that's just one of many examples. It was a flawed arrangement, and it was not particularly a pro-U.S. arrangement, in our view. Some parts were okay, but... A lot of the parts were not. When the president withdrew, he didn't withdraw from Asia, not by a long shot. He withdrew from a flawed deal. You're, it's not your expectation that there's going to be a way for us to then re-enter TPP? It all depends on the terms. Right now, our plate's a little bit full in the trade area. So it's not something that's going to be done today or tomorrow. The continued focus on trade deficits is something else that many people discuss. Some uh, dismiss the focus on it and the idea that it's a zero-sum game, that China's gain is our loss and vice versa. And they point to growing budget deficits as one of the key reasons that we have a trade deficit, the connection between the two. Do you buy that connection? <clears throat> no, I don't. If you look at a chart about China's history, their GDP was bumping along. Suddenly, they get admitted to the WTO. It zooms. Trade surpluses suddenly zoom. Hours suddenly go bad. That's not a function of trade deficit. That's a function of behavior. So when you go to China tonight and begin your meetings, how, how many days, by the way, are you scheduled to be there? It, it all depends on how they progress, but we expect to be back over the weekend. Over the weekend, but conceivably it could be a number of days. Oh, well, it could be shorter if it's not satisfactory. Oh, right. All right. So if we're, you're coming we're, back we're Thursday, there, we're we're gonna, not, we may have a bad day in the markets. We're not there to see to old temples. <laughs> um, do you go in knowing what constitutes victory? We have a pretty good idea of what we need to come out with, but anything that was discussed over there will come back to the president for approval. Because for sure, even if they gave in on most of the things that we wanted, for sure there'll be some things that perhaps are not totally satisfactory. So this is going to come back to the president. This won't be suddenly in Beijing a breathtaking release, everything is solved. Understood. Uh, what, what would represent uh, a setback, in your opinion? 
I don't think anything much can be a setback. Because, Why not? I don't understand. Why? Because Why? if we don't make a negotiated settlement, we will pursue the 232s and impose them. We'll pursue the 301 and impose it. So one way or another, we're going to deal with this recurring problem of trade with but China. But that will require, to a certain extent, some sacrifice on the part of Americans, whether it's farmers who are no longer going to be able to sell soybeans or any number of other areas of American industry that conceivably will find themselves at the mercy of the back and forth here and what the Chinese may decide to respond in, in kind, right? Well, sure. The, the Chinese have announced what their response would be. The European Union has announced what its response will be. But as you know, the president has a couple of ideas that I think are quite true. Number one, we are the ones in the deficit position. That means they have more to lose at the end of the day than we do. Now, we're not going to be trying to commit suicide here. We don't want to have them die and us die. But it's a fact they have more at risk than we do. Second, when they raise tariffs, say, on our soybeans, the probabilities are they're going to raise their own cost. They don't buy anything from us at a premium price just to be nice to the U.S. That means if we're not selling it to them, they're going to have to get someone else who's not going to charge them as low a price. And particularly, right now, Brazil supplies a majority of the soybeans to China. Yep. We supply around 30 percent. For Brazil to replace all of our soybeans, they would have to export 60 percent more to China. Well, guess what? If they had 60 percent more at the right price, they'd have sold it to them already. So real world, they would have to divert product from some other market to sell it to China. Probably they would want a further premium for doing that for disrupting historic customer relations. And if they did, then the people in that other country still need soybeans and we could sell them. So I think it's far more complicated than just, I'll poke you, you poke me. Trade is an infinitely complex thing, doesn't lend itself to very simple conclusions. All right, well, uh, we wish you luck in your oncoming uh, trip. Thank you. And your negotiations and appreciate you taking some time. Good to see you, David. Good to see you, too. Wilbur Ross, the U.S. Commerce Secretary. Carl, back to you. Hey there. Thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.